Features need to be able to evolve with unpredictable business needs. Features that are simple today are extremely unlikely to remain simple forever. Use state is great for simple local state. But when a feature needs to become more complex, how many developers are going to suddenly throw away all the existing local state code and create a Redux store that takes three times the amount of code? It's much easier to just add another line of imperative code and be done with it. But this syntactic gap between imperative and declarative state management will gradually steer the code base towards a big ball of spaghetti that looks like this real example, the one on the left. The one on the left is the same app as the one on the right, but it's imperative, and the one on the right is the unidirectional or declarative version. The spaghetti code base will be buggier and developers will be less productive in it. It's technical debt and it has to be paid. The code base has traveled along a certain path, and that path is no longer tenable. And in order to get out of it, we need to refactor to a completely different syntax. So we need to undo most of the work we've done and start over on the right path. And that's what I call a syntactic dead end. The only way to avoid these syntactic dead ends is to use tools that enable minimal declarative syntax at each level of complexity. I have seen eight levels of state management complexity. First, simple local state. Second, complex state changes. Third, derived state. Fourth, global state. Fifth, reusable state logic. Sixth, global events or actions. Seventh, asynchronous events. And eighth, combined global derived state. At each level, we will see a fork in the road. Imperative versus declarative. So let's look closely at each level and see what kind of syntax would make the declarative path as easy as possible so we can steer clear of the syntactic dead ends. The first level of complexity is simple local state with use state. Here we just have a name, the initial value is Bob, and we have a button that is going to set the name to Bilbo. And we've got uh, JSX here, so it's already declarative. So there is no risk of implementing this with jQuery or whatever. So uh, we don't need to worry about syntactic dead ends yet. So let's look at the second level of complexity, state changes, complex state changes. So let's say we need to add a button to reverse the name. We need to choose between a declarative and an imperative style. In the declarative style, all code that controls a piece of state is included in the state's declaration. The imperative style is the opposite of this, where state is controlled from inside event handlers away from the state's declaration. This screenshot was taken from the React Hooks presentation, and they highlighted by feature here. And before, when React used more callback functions or lifecycle methods, um, the code was organized by when it was running, uh, but after hooks, we're able to co-locate the code by the state it's controlling. So all the code related to a certain piece of state is in one place, part of, the part of its declaration. Let's see how we would implement this imperatively first, so we know what to avoid. To solve it imperatively, we would just add an event handler that would contain the state management. So it would call set name, and then it would do the split, reverse, and join. And then we would call that uh, callback function from the button. And at this point, we have already started down the path towards a syntactic dead end. It looks harmless now, but as, as this feature becomes more complex, that event handler will likely take on more and more responsibilities, and that state will be controlled by more and more event handlers. We will eventually have to remove the code we just wrote in order to get rid of the mess. So let's not let's Let's not write that code to begin with. How do we do this declaratively? Well, this is the problem that UserDoucer was created to solve. With UserDoucer, we can put the state change logic in the state's declaration directly. So first, we're going to swap out use state for UserDoucer. Then we're going to define the action type that we're going to be taking in inside UserDoucer. Then we're going to create that function that takes in the action and returns state. And then we create the um, logic for when the action is the set action, and then do the same thing for the reverse action. And then we change the original button to now dispatch an action of type set. And then we can add our button to um, dispatch the reverse action. The benefit of this is it's extremely similar to the syntax we'd use if we converted to a global Redux store later. And it's declarative meaning all logic that controls what the state will be is centralized in its declaration. 
The drawback is that this is awful. There's so much work to add the syntax for this state change, it's no wonder most developers take the imperative path that eventually leads to spaghetti code. And other tools are disqualified as well. Redux is just like this, but slightly worse. If our official policy was to only use use reducer or Redux, most developers would constantly be delaying or putting off the moment where they change over to that syntax. They would stick with use state as long as possible. So they'd be adding imperative event handlers and they would be going down for further and further along the imperative path. So what we need is syntax that makes the declarative style just as easy as the imperative style. Now, I'm not an expert in every state management library in React, but I couldn't find anything that could solve these problems for Angular apps. So I created my own solution called State Adapt, and I recently made the React integration a lot nicer. But if you're aware of anything that's close to what I've created for React, please let me know. And uh, regardless, whatever tool you use to solve these problems will uh, have a pretty similar syntax. Otherwise, it wouldn't be solving the problem. So let me show you how to solve this with state adapt. So first you swap out use state with use adapt and you pass in name and that is the namespace in the global store that's going to be um, reserved for this piece of state. And then you get rid of set name and replace it with a name store um, and it has a set method on it. And then you refer to that state uh, on, on the uh, first part of the tuple that's returned. Okay, now we're ready to add the logic for that reverse state change. And we do it declarative, declaratively right there inside the declaration of that state. And then we can call the reverse method on that store. This is slightly more work than the imperative solution, but it's not bad and it's declarative. So it's higher code quality than the imperative solution and it's only slightly more work, but it's a lot less work than use reducer. So hopefully this makes it a lot easier for developers to continue down the declarative path. Okay, now level three, derived state. So derived state in React is trivial. Uh, let's say we want to display the name in all uppercase letters. In React, all we have to do is add to uppercase onto that state string and it's in a JS exp expression. So it's declarative and it's derived state, but it gets more interesting when we need to actually share that derived state in state adapt. We do this by adding a selectors object. So this is what the solution looks like with state adapt. Um, and so we have two choices. One of them is very simple. The other is a little bit more work, but if we choose the simple one, are we going to regret it? Is it going to be a syntactic dead end? So actually, here's the work required to do this simple, uh, just put it in the declaration solution, the, the expression. Um, after this, to convert to state adapt shareable derived state, you just add a selectors object and then move that logic up to that new selector called uppercase and then refer to that selector. So actually, Everything we did for pure local state was something we would have needed to do anyway to make it shareable. So we don't need to actually worry about any syntactic dead ends with derived state. Okay, global state is a bit more interesting. It is very easy to move from local state to global state with state adapt. First, you copy the state declaration out of the component. And so now, now you have two uh, use adapt calls where you used to have just one and outside the component you change it to just adapt and inside the component you change it to use store and then outside the component you only uh, return the store and then inside the component you only return the states and you pass in the name store so that was actually extremely easy that is actually I don't think there's an easier way to do that and that's because declarative state, declarative code is more portable. Okay, so that actually wasn't very hard. Um, now, uh, reusable state logic. Sometimes you not only need to share state, but also the logic that controls that state. For example, let's say you have a paginated data grid 
and the designer produces a design that puts a second data grid of the exact same kind on the same page. You'd want to reuse the state logic between the two separate instances of state. I've actually had this happen. This doesn't happen very often, but when it does, if your state logic is coupled to specific state and specific event sources, you're going to have a bad time, like I did. So, in order to avoid this dead end, you need to be putting all of your state logic from the beginning in a class or object that can be easily moved around independently. So here's how state adapt solves this scenario. You create an adapter, and then that object that you've been defining as part of the store, you just split it out and put it inside the adapter, and then you refer to that adapter, the name adapter, inside the store. And this is equivalent to what we had before. Um, but then you can just copy that store declaration and suddenly you have two stores and all the logic that applied to the first store is now part of the second store. And so you can just add an extra set of buttons that will control the, uh, the second store. So this was designed to be as easy as possible, and I don't think there is an easier way to do this. Okay, now, level six, shared events or actions. Let's say we need to add a button to reset both stores back to their initial states. Once again, we need to choose between an imperative style and a declarative style. So let's look at imperative first. First, we would add an event handler, and inside that event handler, we would uh, refer to each store and reset it. And the reset function just comes by default uh, with each store. Um, and then we call that function from a button. But notice now that, again, we have, we have uh, put some state change logic outside of the declaration of the store. So we've already started down the path towards a syntactic dead end again. And as the feature becomes more complex, that event handler will take on more and more responsibilities, and that state will be controlled by more and more event handlers. We'll eventually have to remove the code we just wrote in order to get out of the mess. So let's not write it in the first place. So how would we do this with state adapt? Well, let's talk about Redux for a second. The reason Redux is declarative be is because each reducer or piece of state declares for itself which actions it's interested in and how its state reacts to them. State is downstream from actions. The state declares itself and it's reactive to actions. So it's declarative and reactive. State app uses RxJS to achieve this exact same kind of uh, reactive declarative state management. With state adapt, you define a source, which is like a subject, and it takes in a string, which is going to be the action type for Redux DevTools. And that source will, it's a subject, it's an observable that emits action objects, just like in Redux. And these stores are able to, by themselves, refer to that source and react to it. And the way it reacts is by specifying the state change function uh, from the adapter. In this case, it's reset, which just comes with every store. And so it's determining for itself that it's going to react. Okay. And now from the template, we can call the, uh, we can, we can uh, call, call dot next on that source and both stores will react. So that ends up just being one extra line of code compared to the imperative solution. So it should be easy to stay declarative at this level of complexity as well. But because we're using RxJS and the store is referencing those streams directly, we're going to be able to be even more declarative than Redux. So level seven, asynchronous events. Okay, let's say we need to load the names from the server. The name from the server can be declared as an observable and state adapt gives you a way to convert any observable into a source. So to source is an operator and the string is the action type again. It's going to show up in Redux DevTools. And now you can reference that source in the stores. So with the set uh, state change name, that's that actually also is uh, actually also comes 
default with every um, store. And again, the re reason this is more declarative than Redux is because usually you have like Redux Observable or NGRX Effects that declares relationships between actions, but in the end, it's defining the action streams, uh, whereas here, the action streams are declared in one place, and then the store directly references those streams. So it's easier to follow. Basically, to know if something is declarative, you just do click to definition, and if you can't answer your questions about why something is the way it is by clicking to definition, it's not declarative. And in this case, you can click to definition all the way from the JSX up to the event sources. Okay, now the final level of reactivity that I know of. Let's say we want to show a message called hello Bob's when both names are Bob. So we want derived state that is true when both names are Bob, and we want to be able to use this in potentially multiple components. The syntactic dead end for this feature is actually using ArxJS. Because ArxJS is great for declarative asynchronous logic, but it's not great for synchronously derived state, as I've explained in the past in other videos. And I'll put a link to an article in the description where you should be able to find uh, where I've explained this before. Um, selectors are best. So um, in State Adapt, all stores are actually part of a global store. And we join our mini stores here to select from their states as part of that global store. So if you've heard of the diamond problem reactivity, this, uh, this solves it. And then you can just reference this joined store in the component and the selector, the new selector we've defined is available on the states. So yeah, just very, very similar to how you would handle any other store. Unfortunately, this isn't quite as concise as it could be if you just want to define one selector that, that combines state from multiple stores, but it actually avoids a different syntactic dead end that is a little too obscure to talk about in this video. Um, for more information, you can look at State Adapt documentation. Just Google State Adapt and then go to the ArxJS package and find join stores. It explains it there. So uh, that's the final level of reactivity that I know. So here is uh, how the co code would have looked if we had taken the imperative path every time. Actually, if we'd just gone down the original imperative path and done everything imperatively after that. So on the left, it's imperative, and the right is declarative. And I used Jotai in the example on the left, but I'm sure it could have been used more reactively than I did here. I just use it as a simple way to share state between components. So if you ask yourself the question, why is name one the value that it is? In the declarative implementation, like I talked about before, you can click the definition until you get the answer. Everything is centralized and directly reference. Um, it directly references what it needs to define itself. But in the imperative implementation, you have to use find all references because name one is controlled from many places. The, the logic is scattered. So, and this is a very, very simple example. In real world applications, the imperative style becomes much, much harder to follow. It becomes more like that diagram I showed at the beginning. And like many developers, I'm too lazy to implement this in Redux but you can imagine it would have been quite a bit more code. And as a consequence, the odds that a developer would have taken the imperative path at some point would have been very high. So it seems for most teams that the, uh, that adaptive state management is the right way to go if you want clean, maintainable code. So um, if you use state adapt or something with very similar syntax, you should be able to easily avoid the syntactic dead ends, and then you won't regret starting off with just a simple use state. Um, state Adapt is very close to releasing, uh, releasing version 1.0, and I'd love to hear what you think about it. I'd love to hear if you think, uh, if, if you've seen other examples of state management patterns that I didn't account for in uh, this video, but yeah. Yeah, let me know, and please check out State Adapt and give me feedback, and uh, let me know how it goes. All right, thanks for watching.